Hello, everybody. I hope you're having a good day. Uh, we're going to have another sermon here about just trying to get by. You know, a lot of people are, we're trying to get by in this world, and we look forward to our heavenly home. And other people are just trying to make it through life without uh, a big disaster. And, of course, the times get crazy from, and, uh, yes, the, we can also notice that, um, the world has gone crazy too. So how do we get by? But that's not going to be the focus of our lesson. Uh, this sermon is something that I, I think uh, if you listen and pay attention carefully, you're going to have to do some self-examination. And whether you are in need of this lesson, you certainly know a lot of people who are. So take this lesson down, consider it, share it with others, uh, discuss it with others, and um, help them get to heaven. All right, here's our lesson today. Okay, just trying to get by. So we, we, we asked the question, what are the bounds of Christian liberty? And here's a question, what is the least I can do and still get to heaven? Well, here, let's be honest here. If you're asking this question, I can tell you that you won't make it there. And that, that's an honest, unless you make a lot of changes in your life. Because if you're just trying to get by and just trying to get, do the least you can and still get to heaven, then you're not going to go there. Heaven is for those who diligently seek to serve God and to fulfill their Christian duty. And if you're trying to figure out what's the least I can do and still get to heaven, you're not going to make it. I mean, that, that's just a, a fact we have to consider. And it's really sad because, you know, a lot of preachers just gloss over this. And, uh, you know, when they say, what's the least I can do? Well, they'll, they'll try and come up with four or five things that they should do. But you know, when the, when the young lawyer came up and asked Jesus, what, what can I do to get eternal life? He says, well, what does the, what does the law say? He says, don't do this, don't do that. And the, the lawyer said, well, I've done that all my life. Then Jesus said, you're still lacking something. And so, yes, uh, if we go through and do four or five basic commands and think that's gonna get us into heaven, we're sorely mistaken. All right, the question lacks a motivation to serve the Lord with the whole heart. See, that's the problem with that question. Uh, it doesn't have any motivation. In fact, it, it's, it's the anti-motivation, if you wanna think about it. The question indicates that one cannot let go of the world and put their trust in God. And most likely that's the reason. Um, so that, that's an indicator right there that one is not interested in serving God, but yet they also know that the horrible place called hell is someplace they don't want to go. So they just want to do the least they can just to avoid hell. It's not going to work, folks. See, God warns us that we cannot love the world and still receive his blessings of eternal life. All right, let's notice what we see. See in James 4.4, Says so you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so that's right. There are limitations we have to consider, and we are placed under limitations. And Second John 9 says, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. So yes, there are limitations for us. And James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So yeah, that's some good advice there. And Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. You see where we're going with this. There, there's things that we have to do in order to get to heaven, and that includes, and that does involve action, not doing as little as possible, but as much as we can. 
So there's limitations of liberty also. See, while we become free from sins through our obedience, we do not have the freedom to sin. See, the command from God is do not sin, don't sin. You know, 1 John 4, 1, no, 1 John 2 and verse 1, we command you to sin not. And so, yeah, that's what we're supposed to do. We have to look at our perfect example of Christ in whom there was no sin, no guile in his mouth, and he did good in everything he did. We're to follow that example perfectly to the best of our ability. And so we don't have freedom to sin. You know, many teach that the grace of God, which is free, overlooks sin. And that is false teaching. God does not overlook sin. The grace of God does not overlook sin. If we continue in sin, Hebrews 10, 26 tells us there no longer remains a sacrifice for our sin. So if we have sin in our lives, God looks and, and this is what they say. We have sin in our lives, God looks and sees Jesus, and thus we can be saved because of the sacrifice of Jesus. That's what people teach the grace of God does. It doesn't work that way, folks. No, we have to stop the sin. And so we, we have to change the way we do things. It doesn't work that way. Now, here's our problem. And you'll, you'll, you'll probably notice this if you're in this condition or know somebody is. People do not like restrictions placed upon them. Really? Yeah, that's true. People do not like restrictions placed upon them. And when a law restricts them from doing what they want to do, they're going to violate that law if they think they can get away with it. And nowadays lately, it seems like, yeah, anybody can get away with it. Just start yelling certain keywords and, and you can do whatever you want to do. And uh, it, it, it's getting pretty bad out here in our world. See, God, by demanding obedience, is restricting what many people want to do. And so a lot of them say that's not fair in most people's minds. Oh, no, that's not fair. I can't have any fun. We've heard that argument before. See, every religion has restrictions. And if you're going to participate, any religion that does not have restrictions is not a religion. You're not adhering to something. So it's just do as you please. And for a lot of people, that's the religion they want, is just do as you please. Whatever your heart finds to do, do it and feel good about it. And then maybe if you feel guilty, guilty about it later, you can ask for forgiveness then. No. The problem is that in each and every religion, there are those who seek to lessen the severity of ignoring the restrictions. And yes, with Bible teachers and, and people who claim to be believers of the Bible, we have them too. They want to take away the severity of ignoring the restrictions. In other words, uh, let's get rid of hell. You know, there's a lot of people teach that hell does not exist and people will just be annihilated. And so that, that thinking like that gets people, well, there's nothing to pay for. I'll just be burned up and I'll be gone. It'll all be over. But see, Jesus talked about hell as being eternal, lasting forever. And that's why it's so terrible. We shouldn't want to go there. All right. See, we also have double standards applied by man. One people want one thing, one people want another. And depending on who is doing it, yeah, we see this in, in politics and in the news media and other places. We see these things. See, and for the most part, a man cheats on his wife. Oh, well. I mean, it's just kind of like, well, oh, well, it happened. And then a woman cheats on her husband. Everybody calls her a hussy. And so that's a double standard. And that's not right. Neither one should be cheating on their spouse. And so we do that. And we see how the different political parties are treated by the media and society where one party just allows it. And uh, uh, some of them say, well, it doesn't matter what my candidate does. I'm going to vote for him anyway. And that's just wrong. So, see, a white man does the same thing a black man does, and they're judged differently. 
And that's not right. It is not right. Usually the black man is going to get a stiffer punishment than the white man. And there's just no justice there. So that needs to be fixed. And hopefully people are working on that to get it done. And people from different cultures allow their culture to dictate what is right and wrong. And they don't let the Bible dictate their culture. It's a cultural thing. And I have another video about culture uh, that you might want to check out. All right. God has always had limitations. God has always had restrictions on his people. See, Genesis 2, 16 and 17, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. See, the Ten Commandments, along with the whole Mosaic Law, had limitations. There were certain things, thou shalt not do, or thou shalt do this. And so each one of those had limitations. And even with the freedom in Christ, we have limitations. Now, some questions. And these are going to be probing questions, and we'll, we'll just kind of go through these pretty quick. And you're going to have to answer it for yourself, but I want you to consider them, maybe even write them down if you want to. All right, so back to our title, some are still asking, what can I do or not do as a Christian and still be pleasing to God? I mean, that's a question they're asking, and, and we know the why. We know what motivates them to ask this question. So this is the wrong attitude here. They have the wrong attitude. And so there are several questions we should consider. Am I a Christian in name only, or do I live like I am supposed to? There's a lot of people wear the name of Christ uh, all over the place, and they take that name with them into the bars, into the, the strip joints, into um, the places where gambling is taking place and other sins are taking place. And that's not right, but they do it anyway. Am I doing anything to bring glory to God? And most likely, the people that we're talking about, they don't do anything to bring glory to God. They still want to go to heaven, of course, and they still say they love God, but uh, are they doing anything in this life to bring glory to God? And by that, I mean letting your light shine so that others can see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven, Matthew 5, 16. Now, we can also say, do I want to go to heaven? Well, duh, doesn't everybody? Yeah, everybody wants to go to heaven, and a lot of people think they're going to heaven. But the problem is, most of the people who think they're going to heaven are not going to get there. Only a few are going to get to heaven. That's what Jesus said. And so it's our attitude and in, in conjunction with our obedience is going to help us determine whether we get to heaven or not. Am I willing to give up all in order to go to heaven? You know, that's, that's one of the things Jesus talked in uh, uh, Luke 9 and Luke 14 about the cost of discipleship. You got to be willing to go all in to serving God. And some people aren't willing to do that. Am I willing to grow and develop into a better Christian? And they all say they do, but yet you give them the opportunity, they don't do it. I mean, it gets to the point where, you know, the Hebrew writer, even back in those days in the first century, he was telling those people, man, you've got it. You need to be taught again. You ought to be teachers by this time. You've been around long enough. You've been in Christ long enough. You should be able to teach others, and you have to be taught again. And believe me, as a preacher, a lot of people always coming up here saying, well, I wish I knew the Bible like you do. My standard response is always open the book and start reading, open the book and start studying. And that's what you need to do. And so, yeah, some people say that, that, but are they willing to put in the time to read the scriptures and to study the scriptures and understand the scriptures, maybe even get involved in a Bible study with someone else and discuss the scriptures. Will my behavior demonstrate my love for God or will it demonstrate a friendship with the world? See, here, here's where the, uh, where, where, where the rubber meets the road here. In other words, 
you can say all day long that you love God, but what do your deeds show? What do your actions show? Take the time to read Titus 1.16 and see if you don't fall into that category. All right, here's another thing. Do my friends know that I'm a Christian? You know, first of all, they should know. In fact, your friends should be Christians. That's the type of people you should be hanging around with. But if your friends don't know that you're a Christian, number one, you haven't told them. And number two, you haven't demonstrated it. So you're not living the life of a Christian. If they don't know that you're a Christian, you haven't been demonstrating that life. And really, I'd say you should be ashamed of yourself because our goal as Christians, our responsibility is to lead others to Christ and you haven't been doing anything to help them get to Christ. Can I produce any evidence that I am a Christian? You know, it's like they say, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be any evidence? And a lot of people cannot do it. What's the evidence? Well, I go to church every now and then. <laughs> I mean, church attendance, uh, even though God requires it, is really not evidence of you being a Christian. You know, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in your garage makes you a car. I mean, it just, just because you're where some Christians are doesn't make you one. And then, so we ask the question, can my actions be pleasing to God? Yeah, we, we, we need to find out, are my actions pleasing to God? How would I know if my actions are pleasing to God? Well, you know, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, handling the right, the word of truth. That's how we can be pleasing to God. Uh, Peter told Cornelius, in every nation, he that feareth God and worketh his commandments is acceptable to God. But most likely, here's what you're doing, and you ask yourself, Will I bring reproach upon Christ or his church by my lifestyle? I mean, if you aren't a goody two-shoes, if you aren't living right and righteously in the sight of God, then you're, you're casting a bad name upon Christ. And most likely the people you hang around will not want anything to do with Christ. So yeah, you gotta understand these things. And for a lot of us, even though we're, we're good, we, we go to church and do that, have I made any effort to lead others to Christ? I mean, here, here's a question you need to do because uh, basically I heard one preacher say, you can't go to heaven without taking someone with you. And I believe that's true. You have to make effort to lead people to Christ. Now, once you lead them to Christ, I mean, it's their choice. They have to make that decision on their own. But uh, if you don't ever even teach them, you know, Hebrews 12, 15 says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. God's grace is made available to everybody, but if we don't teach them, if we don't share the grace of God with people, they're not gonna know. All right, now where do we need to focus? There are several areas. I'm sure we could ask many more probing questions, but I think you've probably had enough of those and you, you probably, uh, if you're in that category, you've probably already stopped watching this. But, but anyway, if you're still here, we're gonna ask some more questions. Uh, and these should be sufficient to make our point. See, the Christian has many responsibilities in our living to be acceptable to God. And some of these areas of duty are our focus in worship. I mean, do we worship in spirit and in truth? John 4, 24. Do we follow the commands and examples of the New Testament pattern of worship? I mean, we should be doing that, or do we do our own thing? Or do I just occupy a pew and feel good about myself? You know, really, that's, that's all I can say about some people. They don't live the life of a Christian, but yet they still show up in church and, and they occupy a, few, a pew for an hour. And uh, they feel good about themselves. They think they're doing what they need to do in order to get to heaven. That's the least they can do. All right. Our focus in our work, is it honorable work? I mean, some people don't have honorable work. Does it provide me the chance to provide for my family and others? 
and does it allow me time to serve God? There's a question. You know, some people get jobs and uh, they may not have a choice. They may have to work on Sunday when the, when the saints are assembled. But sadly, I've seen a lot of people who claim to be Christians, they, they, they work overtime on Sunday to make more money, and yet they stop going to church. And so, um, yeah, we got to ask that question. Our focus on recreation, does it distract from serving God? Some people get really hyped up about their hobbies and, and their recreation, and they, they, they focus on it so much that really God takes second place. Uh, and if I'm doing games and interacting with others, do I play with fairness towards all? I mean, we should. Am I obsessed with it to the point of God taking second place? Actually, if God is taking second place, he's actually farther down than that because um, you know, what, whatever it is, it's either you first, your, your hobby first, or it's God first. And you've got to decide which one you're going to put there in first place. We know Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. What about our speech, our focus and our speech? Does it build up or tear down? Yes. I, I mean, how we talk to others. Uh, is it something that builds them up or tears them down? Is it wholesome? You know, our speech is supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be for edification and seasoned, as it were, with grace. Would anyone find our language offensive? How you talk with your friends, would you walk into the church building and talk the exact same way with members of the church? I mean, if you wouldn't, then you, there's something wrong, and that needs to change. See, granted, speaking the truth is offensive to those not willing to live by it. We, we will grant that, but pretty much, uh, if your language is offensive and would offend members of the church, it offends God. So just understand that. And then the focus in our dress. Does it speak of modesty about us? Does it belong to the world or to Christ? And believe me, everybody knows the difference. I mean, if you don't know the difference, you're just actually just got your head in the sand or you're not paying attention. See, what is our purpose for wearing what we wear? Well, for some people, it's to be noticed. For some people, it's to uh, be seen as sexy or something like that. And other people, our purpose for wearing what we wear should be to glorify God and to gather attention or to show respect. I mean, one or the other. Do we consider what others might say or think about us by what we wear? You ever think about that? I mean, sometimes, well, well, it's my body. I'm just going to do what I want to do. I'm going to go where I want to go and wear what I want to wear. But if you met another Christian somehow, some way, what would they think of you by the way you are dressed? All right. Many more things we could consider, but these should be sufficient. See, our associates, our places of recreation, our habits, and just about everything that people see describes you. That's what you are. They associate you with all of those things. And so when they hear your name, they understand that. See, you know, Ecclesiastes 7 1 says a good name is better than a good ointment. And, and yes, we, we have to have a name that sticks out. When people hear our name, they think Christian. They think good, honest character. They think uh, someone who is very nice and pleasant to be around. That's what they should see. Or I don't want to be like that person. I mean, think about it. Serving God certainly has limitations in all these areas. And we must be willing to do those. Are you trying to serve God better than well enough? I mean, that's something you've got to consider. Am I trying to serve God to the best of my ability, or am I just trying to figure out what's the least I can do and still make it to heaven? I mean, hopefully by this lesson, you'll understand that there's a lot you need to get busy doing if you haven't done it already. So learn these things, uh, share this message, uh, uh, like the message, uh, 
comment on it, if you will. And if you want to have some lesson discussed, get, contact me through Facebook or um, uh, YouTube or my email. Anyway, so uh, we're going to end it now. Y'all have a good blessed day, and hopefully we will see you on the next lesson. All right, bye-bye for now.